my dear student colleagues and all the viewers who are watching this program live from facebook page and youtube channel i would like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar so good evening to all here in bangladesh and a very good morning to all those who are watching this program live from usa so hope you are well uh, well and safe from corona pandemic so as we know that we are staying in a corona pandemic situation so it's very difficult for us to continue our normal academic program uh, we we have to start our online program i think you have already come to know that the department of physics of the university of science and technology has started its online pro program including international physics webinar and we have successfully completed our 217 international physics webinar and uh, today it's our 210 international physics webinar and uh, today we'd like to welcome you all to a joint session between our department department of physics pabna university of science and technology and the department of physics and astronomy university of uta usa and we have with us here today dr dev kiedon son uh, dean graduate school distinguished professor of physics and astronomy university of uta usa and he has already connected with us so, sir good morning and uh, good evening here so th good thanks morning. for joining with us Thank you. It's my honor and privilege, sir, to host you in our international physics service, sir. So before going to you, I'd like to uh, introduce you uh, with our student and viewers. So dear student and viewers, I think you have already come to know that the title of the of our international physics service, the title is the visible band observations of nearby stars with sub uh, milli arc second resolution using stellar intensity interferometry. And our speaker is Dr. Uh, Dev Kieda, Dean of the Graduate School, Distinguished Professor of Department of Physics and Astronomy, University of Utah, USA. And uh, we can see uh, he has uh, completed his bachelor degree from MIT and, uh, and his PhD degree from uh, University of Pennsylvania in astro experimental astrophysics. And uh, we can see his professional career. Uh, he has uh, started his career as an instructor of physics department South Dakota School of Mines and Technology in 1984, and then uh, in 1982 to 1983, uh, his, uh, he working as a he, he was working as a teaching assistant at the physics department, University of Pennsylvania, an instructor. Uh, of, of, sorry, and uh, in 1983 to 1989, he worked as a worked as a research assistant at the Department of Physics, University of Pennsylvania, and in. In 1989 to 1990, he worked as a research associate at the Department of Physics, uh, University of Utah. And uh, from 1992 to 1996, he was uh, worked uh, as an assistant professor uh, at the same department, same university. And uh, from 1996 to 1992, he worked as an associate professor, uh, Department of Physics, University of Utah. And, uh, uh, from 2003, 2013 to present, uh, he's working as a dean of the graduate school, University of uh, Utah. And from 2002 uh, to present, uh, he is working as a professor of the physics department, University of Utah. So uh, uh, I, I, I think you will enjoy our uh, this session. Uh, and uh, uh, this is an exciting session. So thanks, sir, uh, for uh, giving us this opportunity to add in such an important webinar. It's your time, shall you can start your session. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be uh, invited to give a talk at your at your prestigious university. Um, I, I would like to say the University of Utah, it's a great university. And so uh, we do uh, not only physics and astronomy, we have all sciences and have uh, you know medical school, things like that. So if you're ever interested in the University of Utah, uh, please, please give me a contact. Uh, I, I'm glad to introduce you to the, the programs we have at the University of Utah for graduate studies. That's what I'm in charge of. I, I, I work with international students that are uh, interested in oh, science, okay. astronomy, and, and, and working on PhDs and, and advanced degrees. Okay, so I thought I'd say a little bit today about this project we're working with. As you can see in this picture, this is the Veritas telescopes, and they're located in T Tucson, Arizona. It's a very dry part of the United States uh, near Mexico. And uh, the, the Veritas Observatory looks at high energy gamma rays. And so these are very, very energetic photons that are made by black holes, neutron stars, supernova remnants, active galactic nuclei, things like that. 
And so this has been an operation. I've been working on this project for over 20 years now. But the last few years, we added a new capability to this. And we can actually do visible light astronomy using these telescopes. So it's kind of a, a, a neat trick that we can take an existing instrument and, and put a, uh, a new type of instrumentation on it and do a completely different type of science with it. And so this has been growing over the past few years. So I've had some great successes. It's such an interesting uh, idea because it combines the idea of optics and quantum optics and uh, quantum mechanics and astronomy at the same time. And it leads us to look at the universe with new eyes, uh, with, a, with a capability that nobody else has. And so that's why this is a, a very interesting project. Um, it's something, it's a capability that, that nobody else has uh, to be able to do. So I thought I'd start out with just a brief retrospective of astronomy. And astronomy really began, uh, at, least, at least using instruments back in 1609. And this is Galileo and Galileo's telescope in Italy. Um, it was just a very small thing uh, about this, that the lens was about the size of, you know, a, maybe, maybe a, a, a small apple. And, but what it allowed it to do was it had an aperture that was large enough that allowed him to first start to see the planets as something that were not uh, just points in the sky, but actually he could resolve things. He could take an image of them. And that actually changed the world. So that's this uh, part over here. As he told people about this in the, uh, in the in the in the church about what he saw, they weren't so happy about the fact that that uh, that that these that the sky actually was not just little points, but there actually were things going on. But nevertheless, um, by taking those images, it changed the view of the world and the way that the the world understood cosmology from being some points into the sky to actually being something that's a physical laws that we understand and physical laws that are manifested throughout the universe. If we come forward to today, probably the most famous large telescope is the Hubble. It's been having some problems in the last last month or so, and it will, will soon be replaced by the James Webb Space Telescope. But nevertheless, it works on the same sort of principle, a very large mirror, you collect the light, and then there's a sensor on the other side. And um, from that, we make all sorts of discoveries. Our, we understand our universe from, uh, from those observations. And... Okay, so if we, if we want to talk about the resolution of an astronomical instrument, it actually is related. It has to do to the uh, diameter of the lens. And so this is the uh, Rayleigh criterion, it's called. So if we want to resolve something with an angular diameter, which I call, we'll call theta here in the middle, it's one point, the resolution you can get is 1.2 to the, the wavelength divided by the diameter of the lens. Or if we use two telescopes separated by a baseline, you get the same equation, 1.22 wavelength of light you're looking at divided by the baseline. So when uh, it turns out that the diameter of your eye is not sufficient, you can see the moon and you can see the sun, but you don't have enough resolution to see a planet, to actually take a picture of a planet like this with your eye. But with Galileo improving the diameter to be several centimeters, it turns out then yeah, you could actually see, take an image of a local planet that way, but you couldn't see a star. So the largest planets are 30, micro, uh, 30 arc seconds. They're quite large. And the largest stars that are available are on this scale here, 30 milli arc seconds. And a milli arc second is one one thousandth of a, or arc, milli arc second is one one thousandth of a second, so of an arc second. So it's a very small uh, thing. And most telescopes that have to be on the order of, uh, you know, several meters to be able to start to see the diameters of these. The typical bright stars are on the order of a milli arc second. And to be able to resolve that, you have to have a telescope which is 100 meters in diameter. So this plot over here shows you if I have a star at a certain distance and a certain size. These are the different types of stars that we know. The hottest stars are the O stars, O, B, A, F. And, uh, and if you put those at different distances, this is the size of telescope you would need to be able to see it. Most of the stars that we know in the universe, in our galaxy anyway, they only be resolved when you have a baseline between 100 meters to a kilometer. And so um, that's a very large piece of glass and no, and no telescope exists with a thousand meters of, uh, of diameter. Um, the largest one right now, is, they're talking about building one that will be uh, a 30 meter telescope. The largest ones right now are 20 meters, so they're down 
over here someplace. But nobody has anything on the order of a, thousand, of a kilometer yet. But it turns out that you can still do this work um, using uh, arrays of telescopes. I thought I'd just show you really quickly what Galileo saw when he looked through his telescope. If you look at if you look at Jupiter, this is in his logbook. He actually saw individual bright things moving around Jupiter as time went on. These were actually the moons. Um, so he, when he looked inside of his telescope, he saw Jupiter itself as kind of a blob. And this is his edge of field of view. This is what he wrote down in his notebook. And um, and this is kind of what high high resolution imaging looked like in 1609. He would just barely be able to see this with his eye and sketch it out. And so we've come a, we'll come a long way. Uh, now into the into the 20th century with, uh, with with much larger telescopes. This is one telescope which does have a, a diameter of 250 meters. It's called Shara, and it's located in the mountains outside of Los Angeles. And it consists of several small telescopes. So this, if you look at these little tiny things, these are each an individual telescope. So the mirror area is not the area that's glass. The mirror areas are just these little telescopes. But what's done is the light is sent down a vacuum pipe and it comes to the center and they combine them, they combine them optically and then record the interference patterns. And by doing that, you have an effective mirror area of about 250 meters, even though no mirror area itself is, is very large. Each one's only about a meter. In, uh, in, in diameter. But by doing that, by doing this interferometric measurement, um, they were able to do a high resolution image of a nearby star. This is Altair. It's a rapidly rotating star. And so this shows the pole of it. The blue here is not, an, uh, the blue sort of shows the, uh, what, what the star looks like as it's rapidly rotating. It actually elongates at the poles, just like the earth does, uh, I'm sorry, at the, at the equator, because it's spinning and gravity pushes the equator outward. So it winds up being a kind of an oblong type of beast. Um, so these, this is the first time somebody's taking a look at one of these very bright stars, and that's been a rapid rotator, and actually seeing it being flattened out as it's rapidly rotating. So you can learn, you can learn quite a lot from that. One of the things I wanted to point out here, this is in the infrared. You can't do this in the visible light because the atmosphere is too turbulent. And so, um, so this is just done in the infrared light. But what we like to do is we like to be able to, oh, this shows you what Hubble looks like. This is the size of Hubble here by comparison. So this is a much, much larger telescope than, than Hubble has. What we like to do is to try something to um, measure the, try, try to take images of stars, but in the visible light, the, the, the light that we can see with our eyes. And there are a number of reasons why the visible light is more interesting. A lot of the stars that we look at that are the best suited for interferometry, they're hot stars. And they're, they, they, they tend to be white stars or even blue stars. Um, they tend to have a lot of wavelength in those visible wavelengths in, instead of the infrared. And so that's probably the best place to look for them and the best place to image them. Um, so we're going to use a different type of interferometry called Hanbury Brown Twist Interferometry, HBT. And this works on looking at the interference, it's actually a, an interference in intensity rather than interference, interference in amplitude. And so the way to think about this is if I've got a source of light over here, um, and we've seen how interference works before with waves, but for the light, um, it's a quantum mechanical effect. The light will pass through one of these slits, but there's an uncertainty, and they actually wind up bunching in groups over here, one by one. You can watch them uh, group grouping. You can't tell which slit the photon went through. All you know is that it went through one or the other. And over here, you'll see this interference pattern. It'll have a separation with this, this, this distance D here that you'll measure. And this is this angle theta. So the angle theta you can measure depends on the wavelength of the light and the separation. So I could tell you if I measure here on the ground, this distance between where the peak of one of these these interference peaks is and the next one, and I know the wavelength, I can tell you how far away, the, how, how, how separated these two slits are over here. I can actually tell you something about the, the nature of the source, even though I'm nowhere near it. So uh, the reason this works is that photons, have, they obey this spin statistics theorem in quantum mechanics. Photons have a spin one, they're called a boson, and so they constructively interfere with each other. And so when you uh, construct the waveform, uh, the quantum mechanical waveform, you get these, uh, you get these, these correlations that show up where, where at, the, at the focal point. 
So this was used back in the 1970s. Oh, let me let me just show you a, a quick example. We probably have seen this before. Um, if you look at a, a laser beam, and uh, if you've ever seen a speckle pattern on a laser beam, that's sort of what HBT interferometry is. You actually will see these little tiny intense regions here, and they're sort of stable. And by measuring the separation between the individual spots here, or the size of the spots, that correlation distance is related, and the wavelength is related to the size of the little light emitting diode that's in that laser pointer. So we could reconstruct exactly the the, the place where the the light was being generated in the uh, in the laser pointer by measuring the, the distribution of spots that hit a screen. Um, let me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna just go jump over something, and just show you one other example of something that that uh, that that may give you some intuition as to how this might work. There are uh, some physics experiments where we take atoms and we put them into a an atom trap here. So this is what this picture is on the left here, and so we can confine a group of atoms. So we're taking a bunch of helium atoms here. We're going to put them in this atom trap, and we're going to keep them here in a small bunch with some dimension S here. Then if we turn off the atoms turn, and then let them drop to the ground, we can record them on the ground here and with a silicon sensor. And you can record where they hit on the ground. And one of the things we discover is that um, if we're using helium-4, helium-4 is a boson, so it has a spin-1. And at small distances, they get bunched together. And this comes out of quantum mechanics. If we change it from being helium-4 to helium-3, you get an anti-correlation. That's because those are fermions. And so they, they, uh, they, they can't be in the same place at the same time. This is really just unexplainable in classical mechanics. It's a, it's a quantum mechanical effect. But nevertheless, um, you could use this in this particular experiment, which was published in Nature a few years ago. They actually changed the diameter of, this star, of the, where the atoms were correlated. They made the size larger or smaller. And then they remeasure it, and you can actually see the difference of the diameters uh, just by measuring this correlation function. So by measuring this correlation of how the things are bunched as a function of distance and fitting it to, this is called a Bessel function. By fitting it to a Bessel function, we can actually determine the diameter of the, of, of how that, of the size of the cloud of the atoms. So we're going to do the same thing with a star by measuring the photons on the ground and measuring how they drop off, how this correlation drops off as a function of distance of a separation between two telescopes, we can measure a diameter of a star. So this, uh, we're not the first ones to do this. This was done back in the 1960s by Robert Hanbury Brown. And his idea was to use two reflecting telescopes and put a light sensor at each telescope and measure the current from each one. And then he took the two currents, this one I1 and I2, and he multiplied them together and took a time average. And the idea was when the telescopes were close together, this would actually have a, uh, it would start to peak and you move the telescopes apart and it would decrease. And the rate that it decreased told him about the diameter of the star. This is a picture of the uh, experiment. It was in Australia, um, in, 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 uh, in Southern Australia. So they had two of these very large mirrors here. It ran from 1956 to 1971. And these two mirrors here are on these tracks. And so as the star went across the sky, they would move these telescopes, keeping them at different distances and tracking the star. You can see these long cables here. And that took the signal back to a central counting house over here. And that's what they would do, the cross correlation between the two telescopes. Uh, they would park these things at nighttime in this, uh, in this small building over here to protect the, the mirrors. So with this very crude setup, they were able to measure the diameters of 32 stars. Um, for the, the, the size of these things, as we mentioned, milli arc second is the typical diameter of a main sequence star. So these were magnitude 2.5 stars, and they measured 32 of them between 0.41 milli arc second and three milli arc seconds. And this, this goes to show you this two photon bunching. This is from the paper. And so when you go to small distances, you see the correlation between the two telescopes increases. And then as you go to larger distances, it winds up decreasing. So this, by fitting this to a, uh, 
to a function, you can then extract the, uh, the diameter of the stars. Um, this thing stopped working in 1971. And so after that, there were, nobody has pursued any um, observations using this technique uh, since then. And it's partly because there are these newer, in, in, these newer amplitude interferometry measurements, like I showed you this Shara experiment, and they've done very well with small telescopes and getting baselines of 100 or 200 meters um, and being able to do imaging with those. So this is considered to be a very uh, simple technique. Signal to noise was kind of difficult, but on the other hand, um, they could get a very large baseline fairly easily. The uh, amplitude interferometry that Shara does is a much more advanced technique, and it took many, many years, took two more decades before it really started working. It really, the first results from amplitude interferometry really didn't show up until the mid-1990s because the technique was so difficult. So uh, this is our Veritas telescope in southern Arizona. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to try to do this Hanbury Brown twist interferometry uh, with the telescopes. It's very similar to the uh, HBT experiment, except for our telescopes don't move, they're fixed, but they're very similar diameter, 12 meter diameter telescopes. And we've got four of them. And so if we instrument the focal plane of each one of these and measure the light, and then do a cross correlation between each of the individual telescopes, we can make an HBT interferometer. So one of the nice things about these telescopes is they're available during the full moon time. Um, the gamma ray astronomy really can't be done when the moon is up because the atmosphere is very, very bright. But it turns out with the optical astronomy that we're doing, we put a very narrow band filter looking at the optical light. And so most of the moonlight is gone uh, when we do these observations. So we, we, can, we get to get about a week's worth of time every month using these telescopes uh, for free, um, just as long as we don't cause any problems with the, we, we install our instrumentation very carefully, take it off again at the end of the month, and they can resume their operations. Uh, we, can, we can use these telescopes. So, um, so that's, that's, that's the game we're gonna be doing here. We're gonna be looking at, actually it's 416 nanometers. I wrote 400 here, but it's actually 416 nanometers is the, the way I think that we're gonna look at, look at. So here's a general scheme of how we do this. Um, on each of the telescopes over here, we, uh, we place a collimating lens and a narrow band filter and we pass, it, pass the light into something called a photomultiplier tube. And that's a very fast light sensor that turns the phot photon stream, the light stream, into a current. And then the current comes down through the arms and it goes into this data acquisition system called the analog to digital converter. And each telescope has their own. They actually operate independent from each other. And there's just a common clock that synchronizes them. So that way we know that if a photon arrives at this telescope to within a nanosecond, we'll know that we'll know the timing with respect to the, each of the telescopes within one nanosecond, one billionth of a second. The data itself is recorded to a disk. And then the next day, we actually do a, a correlation between the telescopes. So we don't do the interference in real time. We do it computationally using a, uh, using a field programmable gate array. Um, so that's an interesting thing because, you know, to think about is, you know, where is the interference actually occurring? We usually think about interference occurring at a point in time around that focal plane in that disk or in, in the, uh, sorry, the focal plane or on, a, on, a, on, a, uh, on some kind of optical sensor. But instead, the interference is really happening in the software, which is a very strange concept. But it does, it does work out that, it, that you can get this. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a brief picture of the math. And I won't show any more math in this in the rest of this thing. But this, this shows you the, that the mathematics behind this thing. Um, what we're measuring here is we look at the two currents between the two telescopes. IA is a current from one telescope and IB is from the second. And we're measuring the cross correlation between the currents between the two telescopes divided by the average currents of each. That's called, this thing's called a visibility function. It's called the G2 function. And it's related to the interferometric visibility for uh, amplitude interferometry. The important point is that this G1 function is, it's a Fourier transform of the image on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the sky of the star. So if I measure um, some intensity here, this is a, just a measuring the intensity of light as a function of telescope separations. Um, this is a simulation that we did. Um, then you can reconstruct, this was a binary image. 
you can reconstruct the image of a binary star um, using this. So that's how we do this Fourier analysis is by looking at individual telescopes and measuring the cross correlation over dif different distances, putting them in a Fourier plane and doing inversion. This plot over here just shows you the time coincidence. So um, what we did in this one, this was a lab experiment where we separated two of these light sensors by different distances. And then we wound up um, putting a light source and putting a beam splitter on it. And so if I look at the arrival time of photons between one of the one of the light sensors and the other, over here we see this random noise. When we look right on where it should occur, where they're both in time, you see this peak here, and that's that interference peak that, that you can expect to see. So it is a it is a, a measurement that takes a bit of integration time. It needs a lot of light, but nevertheless, you can get a very strong signal out of this. So how do we do this at the Veritas telescopes? What we do is we make a uh, removable camera plate. So this is a picture of the Veritas camera. We're up in the, uh, I'll show you where we are right here. We're up here on the top here. This is actually looking at this camera, which is right here at the top of that Veritas telescope. And we're looking inside the camera. The normal camera for doing gamma ray astronomy are, are this silvery thing here. There are 499 photomultiplier tubes in here. We wouldn't use that, but instead we put our own plate here of specialized electronics, and we put a collapsible mirror. So the light comes in from the telescope over here. It hits the 45-degree mirror, and then it bounces and then hits this. You can see the reflection over here. There's a little diaphragm here and a little center hole. So the light will hit the, the center hole here, and then it re it's recorded by the photomultiplier tube. And then there's a preamplifier here inside of this RF-shielded box. The signal then goes down to the trailer here through these cables over here. There's a high voltage supply. It's battery powered high voltage supply and controlled by fiber optics over here on the side. This is set up so that the mirror collapses at, at, during the daytime and we can close the shutter. But um, when we operate, we open the mirror up, turn the high voltage supply on, and, uh, and then we run for the entire night using these telescopes, uh, using these, these focal plane plates. Each telescope has their own and it only takes about 15 minutes to put, put it on at the beginning of the week. And then we leave it on for the week and at the end of the week, we take it off again. This has worked out really, really well. Um, a very brief schematic of how the electronics works. Um, each telescope here is represented by this yellow box here. And there's a crate of electronics here. So, and then here's our photomultiplier tube, our amplifier, high voltage supply, goes into a digitizer. And then there's a controller here that takes the data from the digitizer and then stores it on this ray drive over here. And then centrally, feeding both this telescope and all the other telescopes, there is something called a white rabbit module. And this actually gives a 10, nanos, 10 megahertz signal sent to each of the telescopes. And that synchronizes each of the telescopes to a fraction of a, of a nanosecond. So that way, if we know that a certain clock cycle here occurred in this one, we can be guaranteed that the clock cycle occurred in the other telescope over here. And then there's other things here associated with just sending data back and forth, a managed switch for data, and some fi optical flashers for synchronizing the, uh, the start of the individual telescope observations. Once we take the data, and the next day we pass it through this thing called a FPGA correlator. So we record the data stream from one and the other one, we actually take the, it's a computational algorithm, and we multiply it together in slices, and then we do some post-correlation post reduction by placing some noise cuts, corrections for optical path delay, and then integrating all these different little, these individual slices together. Some of them get rejected because of noise, but in the end, we wind up then taking the individual slices and then adding them up, and we see this peak here at this time, uh, time lag zero. So this is, this FBG correlator is actually the same one that we use over here. This is the one we actually use for taking the data there at the nighttime and during the daytime, we reuse it to do the analysis of the data. So it saves a bit of money. This shows you the real, really what the data looks like. Um, there is noise pickup that is part of the, of the instrumentation and we've been working to reduce that. But if we look at the cross correlation between two telescopes, the raw data looks something like this. You can see the 79 megahertz signal here. And this signal is something that occurs at the Whipple Observatory. It doesn't occur anywhere else, but we think it has something to do with the telescope being located near the border of, of Mexico. 
And there are military operations there for scanning the border. And we think it has something to do with that. So what we do is we fit a model of the 79 megahertz noise to it until it fits pretty well as the background. And then we subtract it off. And this is our residual signal here, this blue line over here. And the next thing we have to do is then we have to correct for the optical path delay. So as the telescopes are moving, the time delay between the arrival of light from one telescope to the other varies continuously. So you put the optical path the correction in, and then you see the peak over here. Otherwise, the peak gets smeared out over many, many bins, but with the optical path correction, we see a strong peak here. And then we fit this to a Gaussian, and this peak value here is our correlation that we're going to use. If we have a weaker signal, then you can wind up having a smaller signal like this, and it can be delayed in a slightly different direction. But this shows you roughly how we how we get to get it out of the raw data. Um, our 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 goal right now with the uh, with, the, with the Veritas telescope is to improve the data acquisition system, to remove this noise, and to make this a uh, much more sensitive instrument. But again, we, did, we just started this a, a, a little while ago, and so we've made great progress in getting this to work. So you're gonna see some, some results now. So one of the things uh, we published in Nature recently, about a year ago, was results on two stars. Again, this is that same thing I showed you last time. Here are the individual bins, and there's that correlation peak over here. And this is for telescopes T3 and T4. These are fairly close together. And when telescopes are close together, you tend to get a strong peak. For the longest baseline, that would be T1 and T4. You get a weaker baseline. So you take the peak of each one of these, and they become a point here in this plot. So here's our baseline. And uh, here's those long baseline observations. And here's the short ones. And then we can fit this Bessel function to it and get a uh, and extract the diameter. So we did this for this two, two, uh, two stars, Beta, Canis Major, and Epsilon Orion. And each of these had really nice measurements. Uh, if you look at the narrow bride, this was the observations in 1970. They actually measured these stars and they fit a, a uniform disk model to it and they've got 0 0.50 milli arc second. It took 63 hours to make that measurement. Epsilon Orion was about 0.67 milli arc second. They measured again to about 10%, 8% um, accuracy, took about 60 hours. With us, we measured it in about five hours and we got down to a, fra a few percent resolution. This is on the order of um, about 3%, th uh, you know, uh, one, one to 3% resolution on this thing. So, um, so it's, it only took a few hours to do this. So we're clearly about a factor of 10 more sensitive, 10 to 20 more sensitive than the original narrow by intensity interferometer, even with the, uh, the noise levels that we're seeing right now. So I mentioned the noise levels and this past year, we spent some time trying to address these things. So these are some of the improvements that, that we put in. Um, if, you, if you look at the, this is the, shows the focal plane here. This is the photomultiplier tube and the preamplifier. And one of the things we did was we, we noticed that we were getting, this is, this is a spectrum of the signal that we see at the, uh, at the Whipple Observatory. And this shows you the, the frequency spectrum shows this bright 79 megahertz spike here. And again, we have no idea where this is coming from, but we encased electronics in a box here to reduce the noise. And so after the shielding, it went down by about a factor of eight. This is our first attempt at it in December and it worked so well, we applied it to all four of the, uh, the, the Veritas telescopes. And that's helped quite a lot to reduce the noise and make the signal noise better. Another thing that we were adding on, we just added this about two weeks ago, and uh, we're just processing the data from it now. As you remember, if you look at these projected baselines, we're fitting this curve here, we have no measurement here at zero baseline. So this, the only way you can measure something at zero baseline is to put a beam splitter in on a single telescope and measure it with two independent photomultiplier tubes. So that's what that's what we uh, did on one of the telescopes. We put two of these modules in. There's a beam splitter inside of this little plastic pipe here. There's that narrow band filter and reflective screen over here. And so the idea is we're gonna get a data point over here. And then when we fit this curve, um, instead of having this uncertainty here of the fit, we'll actually constrain this curve and improve the, the angular resolution substantially. Okay, so uh, where are we going with this, this, uh, this, this technique? Over the past year and a half, we've been doing a, a survey of stellar diameters. And the goal is to measure 
more than 32 northern hemisphere stars um, and measure their diameters. So we've been doing a survey. We're looking at stars ranging from a magnitude 1 to 3.75 and measuring their angular diameter at 460 nanometers. Nobody's ever done this before. And so this is a, a unique data set. It allows us to uh, try to measure the diameters. And there's some reasons why you want to do this. We'll talk about later. But um, it also allows us to explore the improvements in the system. As I said, we identified noise and ways to improve the, the signal and noise. So uh, the data set allows us to improve the electronics and improve the sampling and the, also the algorithms. We also have to develop survey tools uh, for planning out the observations. And then, then we're going to be sharing the data as well. We'll be placing it on a supercomputer and allowing people to access the data and do their own fits to the data. So one of the things we discovered as doing this observation is the, the moon itself. Remember, we get free time around the moon. It provides some very severe restrictions on what we can do. And so we can only observe, due to several reasons, uh, a source when it's between about 30 degrees and 95 degrees from the moon. So our list of observable targets changes every night. So we, we have a set of priorities now that we use to determine which stars we're going to look at. Uh, typically, we need to have more than an hour of observation per star. Uh, we have an estimate of the stellar diameter, so we choose things that are of appropriate diameter and brightness. We like the O and the B and the A stars, the hottest stars, give us the best signal. And we like to look at unusual stellar characteristics, like uh, pulsating Cepheid variable stars. There, the radius actually goes up and down on the order of hours to days, and we should have enough sensitivity to actually measure the differences in the radius of the star directly um, using using this technique. We can also look at fast rotators, like I mentioned before, this is, that was Altair, and fast rotators, they're no longer round stars, they start to elongate and they get flattened out at the equator as they're rotating around. And so that's, again, additional information that's, that's useful to look at. This shows our summary as of uh, about two weeks ago where we are with our observations. We've done 255 hours of observation since December 2019. On the bottom here, this is the primary star classification. So we've been looking at the hottest stars, the O stars, all the way through the A stars, and different subclasses of them. And these are the visual magnitudes, so ranging from 1 to about 3.7, and different amounts of exposure. The size of the circle tells you how many hours we spent on each target. We've got a wide range of targets, and now we're analyzing the data and trying to understand exactly what the sensitivity of the instrument is and how we can improve that sensitivity in the future. I thought I'd just share some of the first results from the measurement. This is on a very familiar northern hemisphere constellation called Orion. And so Orion is the hunter in the northern sky. And so this is his belt here. And he's got some arms and legs down here. So um, we've measured on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of the stars. We've actually done measurements. And these are the fits of the stars. Um, and you can see that we can extract different angular diameters for each one off of these. So again, we're moving into a stage where we're doing production level and actually mapping out a good fraction of the night sky, northern night sky doing this. Some stars are going to be inaccessible to us. So if we look at this one down here, this is Sirius. And it turns out it's too large. It's the minimum separation we have between Veritas telescopes can't resolve it. So we can see an interference signal from it, but we'd have a hard time measuring the diameter because some stars are just too large for us to resolve. Okay, I thought I'd close out with just talking some things looking to the future and where we hope to go. Um, as I said, we're looking for various improvements and we just recently received some funding from the National Science Foundation to improve a few things. Part of it is reducing the noise, part of it's improving the tracking of the star, but also we're gonna be recoding the mirrors of the telescopes. They, uh, the telescopes haven't been recoded for several years and we can improve the the, the light reflectivity by almost a factor of two. When we do that, on the left-hand side here, this shows a, a typical star that we might observe at magnitude 1.7 in about a half a milli arc second. And so this is the sort of signal that we're seeing now that should look very familiar compared to that some of those pictures in the Orion. Um, if we improve it, then we wind up having uh, much smaller error bars and we have a much tighter fit. What we'd like to do is move from measuring those stellar diameters um, which are on the order of right now 5% type of errors, trying to get down to a fraction of a percent. And uh, there's, there's a good reason for doing that. 
Um, stars themselves actually show uh, limb darkening. So if we think about a star, it doesn't, if the, we take a picture of a star and look at our sun, it's actually not uniformly illuminated, but it actually rolls off, the illumination rolls off at the edge and it becomes dimmer as you get near the edges of the, of the star. So that's, this is called a flat disk model on the uh, upper here on the top. And the bottom, you can see it sort of dims on the side here, and that has to do with looking through more atmospheric depth. That's a, what a real star does. And if you want to measure how the light drops off as a function of distance, you actually have to have about a 1% angular res or 1% radial measurement to be able to do that. So if we look at the main, this is the same correlation here as a function of baseline. If you look at the main peak here, you see some small differences, but we really want to get out here to the second peak here and look for these larger distances over here. So these are different models of limb darkening versus a uniform disk, and the larger baselines break the degeneracy between the models. Um, where this is really important is exoplanets. If we want to look for an exoplanet going across a star, um, how, they measure the mass by looking at how the light curve, how the light curve of the transiting changes as the star starts to enter, the star dims a little bit, and then as the planet goes and leaves, the star starts to brighten. And the way that that, that uh, brightening and darkening happens at the edges tells you the diameter of the exoplanet, and then it tells you the mass. It turns out that they don't really know the limb darkening on most stars. They have models and they can guess, uh, but they, don't, they have no estimation of it. So by measuring this, we actually help to constrain the masses of planets going around other stars. So that's really neat because if you think back to Galileo, that's what he was observing. He was looking at planets around other, uh, looking at moons around other 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 uh, planet uh, other planets, and uh, and trying to determine their masses. Here we're going to be looking at planets and exoplanets and trying to determine their mass. Uh, so Veritas eventually, besides measuring diameters, we should be able to measure images of stars. This is a simulation of uh, we put in a uh, a model of the sun here and made it four milli arc seconds across, and then took a picture of it, uh, using sampled it using fast Fourier transforms using the Veritas telescopes. And then when you reconstruct the image, this is sort of what you wind up with. So it doesn't look great, but on the other hand, you get something that you can see these little hot spots over here and over on this side over here. This doesn't include the noise, but it does include the sampling of the telescopes at the individual baselines. So, um, so there is some hope that we might actually start taking images of stars using the Veritas telescopes. Um, I'm going to jump over this one. Um, I, I, well, I want to make sure we have enough time to, to talk, but let me just say that when you have a rapidly rotating star, if you take a picture of it, this is a model of the star here, and this is the actual picture that Shara took. You see there are these hot spots on the north part. It turns out that because the star is rotating rapidly. Um, the equator bulges out and there's more atmosphere there. So the atmosphere winds up being cooler and the, uh, the pole winds up being hotter. And so that's actually, uh, it's called the von Zeipel effect. And it actually has been seen both in, in this star, but probably most noticeably in one of the, the most important stars in the Northern Hemisphere, Vega. This is a star that's used for calibrating all astronomical observations. And it was only recently discovered that it's a pole-on rotator. So it's rotating around quite rapidly, but it's pointing at us. And because of that, it's bluer than it's supposed to be. So people thought they knew what this star was, but in fact, it's been spectrally misclassified as a star which is much bluer than it actually is. So again, by measuring these images, we get a better understanding of our stars and the standards we're using for astronomy. It's something that uh, you can't do just by using a single telescope and measuring the light spectrum alone. Okay, I'm going to just jump to the last couple of slides as to what comes next. Um, if we look at larger arrays of telescopes, I want to point to this one over here called Shrankoff Telescope Array. And this is a project I'm working on. It's going to be an array of very similar gamma ray telescopes as the Veritas array, except for there will be 50 to 100 of them. It'd be one site in the Southern Hemisphere and one site in the Northern Hemisphere. It'll have much larger baselines approaching two kilometers, which means we'll have much higher angular resolution that we can achieve with it. And um, let me just go show you what, uh, what that same simulation looks like if we use the, the CTA array 
and, uh, and try to image that star, you see you get a much more high resolution image of that star. And you can actually see little tiny flares going on in the star. So this is something that we could look at with a, with an array like this. We could try to understand whether we see the same type of magnetic activity that we see on other stars. Right now, the only one that we only said that we really know has magnetic activity in sunspots and solar cycle is our sun because it's the only one we've ever taken an image of. But this would enable us to look at other stars and potentially start to see flaring activity on those stars and understand how does how do sunspot cycles work on other stars. I think I'll close with this last picture. Um, this was a picture made by Dennis Robbins of CTA, and it, it illustrates the angular resolution that you can get with the CTA telescope. So this would be what you think about having an exoplanet going across a star. This is, I believe it's Sirius. Um, so the stellar diameter is uh, it's about 1.7 times our sun, and this is at about 2.6 parsecs. So it's about six milli arc seconds across. If we had a Jupiter-sized planet going across the, the star as uh, like an exoplanet transit, this is the type of resolution that you'd get from CTA. You would have enough resolution to see not only Saturn, but if it had Saturn-like rings, you'd get those. And you also get those moons around Jupiter um, as well. You actually could watch them going around just like Galileo did 400 years ago, except for we could do this at, a, uh, at, at, at other stars instead of our instead of within our own solar system. Now, whether we can achieve this or not depends on how the instrumentation, if we can develop low enough noise, if we can get enough contrast. But nevertheless, the uh, angular resolution implied by the baselines, two kilometer baselines having that wavelength, this is the type of angular resolution that's implied by, uh, by having a CTA like array. So fantastic stuff. Okay, so uh, in summary, um, we've been doing routine observations with the Veritas Stellar Intensity Interferometer since 2019. We've already demonstrated better than 5% stellar diameter resolution for bright OB stars with only short observations. Our survey progress at this blue wavelength is underway. It's a very unique survey because nobody's ever done this before. Have 255 observations on 39 types, 39 stars, 20 of them are single. 21 of them are single, 18 of them are binaries. And our, our preliminary analysis that we showed of the entire survey data sets, it's nearing completion. And so we'll have more of these maps of individual constellations and the diameters of stars in those constellations coming along very shortly. I'd like to th um, thank my team here. Uh, so I'm the PI of this experiment, but also Stefan LeBoak at the University of Utah. He's a faculty member here, and he's been working with me all along on this. Uh, Nolan Matthews is a graduate student that just finished his PhD a year ago, and he's at the uh, observatory Cote d'Azur in, in near Nice, France. He's doing interferometry now on stars using a different technique. But but anyway, that was this was a number of this, this uh, results are part of his PhD dissertation. And the Nature paper was part of his PhD dissertation as well. Michael Daniel at Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory got a setup at Veritas, and Tara Kassan at Desi. He's now in Spain now doing a postdoc. He helped us out with a number of the uh, secondary analysis on here. So our group is growing. We just added new members from Ohio State University and from uh, University of Delaware onto our team. And we're always looking for people that are willing to collaborate, and we're glad to share data on the telescopes if people are interested in, in looking at some of those things. We'd be glad to, to help out with that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation and exciting tour. So we have got a few questions. Uh, so if we allow, we can start our discussion session. OK. First question. So why do we need full moon for measurement, as you have mentioned in your lecture. Why do we need two what? Why do we need full moon? Oh, the full moon. Measurement? We don't like the full moon. We use the full moon because the telescopes are free. The, the, the observatory doesn't, doesn't observe during the full moon. And so we have a week worth of time every month where the telescopes are unused. So we get free telescope time. 
It turns out that operating in the full moon, it's difficult to see stars that are dimmer than magnitude three. We do have some observations during uh, before the moon rises and before it sets. And with those observations, we can go, we believe we can go to magnitude four now. And as we improve the signal noise, we reduce the uh, electronic noise, we should be able to get to magnitude five and six pretty soon. So the nice thing about going to those dimmer magnitudes is we can look further. The same types of stars in the main yeah. sequence. You can actually, instead of only seeing about, we can, we can see about maybe about 50 stars right now. But as we push to fourth and fifth magnitude, we can see several hundred stars. And so therefore the survey gets much larger. You get a much, much broader sampling of interesting things. Okay, sir, thank you. We have another question. So what is the uh, sunspot? What is which? Sunspot. Oh, a sunspot. Um, so as you look at the sun, there is a solar cycle. And uh, the solar cycle is, it's, tw it's actually 22 years. And it has to do with the magnetic activity of the sun. So if you, if you have a, uh, if you're able to take a picture of the sun, about every 11 years, you see these dark spots on the sun, they show up. And there are some north of the equator and some of them are south. And they're associated with magnetic activity. So um, one, during one part of the cycle, the ones at the north are the north pole of a magnetic, of, of a magnet, and the ones at the south pole are south. And then they, they get larger for a while. And, then the, and you actually can see that the magnitude of the sun decreases a little bit. And then they disappear for a while, and then they flip. So now the south pole goes to the top and the north pole goes to the bottom. So it's on a 22 year cycle and it has to do with the magnetic field of the sun and differential rotation of the material inside the sun, winding up the magnetic field and making it change around and flip. Uh, it, it has effects. We get these uh, solar flares. Um, people talk about being near solar maximum when we get solar flares that affect us on Earth. And that's related to the solar cycle. We don't know if other stars have a solar cycle or not. Um, there is some anecdotal evidence by looking at light curves that many of them may have solar cycles, but nobody's ever seen a sunspot on another star. Um, they've seen large blobs by looking at, uh, very cleverly looking at some of the test curves. You can say that there's something going on, some kind of a excess in some directions, um, but nobody's ever mapped it over long periods of time and seen a solar cycle. So, you know, the question is, you know, what's special about the 22 years or the 11 years? Is that universal or does it depend on the size of the star? Does it depend on what whether it's a, it has more metals in the star or if it's fast rotating? How does it how does it change? And we can't even simulate that it, with a supercomputer. It's too difficult to simulate that. So right now, there, nobody knows. Thank you. Uh, we have we have another question so in the comment section. So uh, can we detect high energy tau neutrinos by imaging air chain for telescope? Yes, that's a that's a separate topic. We're not doing that here. But um, in fact, uh, there is a project that I'm working on in Utah at the top of a very high mountain. We're using very similar types of mirrors and very similar electronics, fast electronics. And they were pointing downward at the edge of the earth. And we're looking for the neutrino to come up through the edge of the earth and then make this flash of light from the tau neutrino. So that one, uh, we have a design for it. In fact, that was just funded by the National Science Foundation for a prototype uh, about a month ago. And so that's, that'll be going on a very high, uh, it's about a, oh, it's about 3,000 meter high peak in southern, southern Utah in the next couple of years. Thank you. We have another question. So the question is, can we scale quark balloon plasma by HBT interferometry with the lepton here? Yes. Yes, it's, it's obviously a different way, but the way that's done is you look at pions. So if you look at the quark gluon plasma and there are pions that are emitted, it turns out that they also have this interference, this HBT interference. So at the, at the Brookhaven National Lab, um, there is an experiment where they actually use HBT interferometry to look for uh, to look for these cross correlations. And one of my collaborators, Mike Lisa from Ohio State University, he started working with us on doing this work, this work on astronomy. But his background for the past 30 years has been looking at quark gluon plasmas and looking at pion correlations and extracting the dimensions of the 
of the quark muon plasma from the from the from the measuring those those pion correlations. So HBT interferometry shows up everywhere. It's a it's a neat technique. Yeah. You can use it on stars. You can use it on subatomic particles. Another place people use it is on, in olive oil. So if you make if you have olive oil that you're measuring and you put a light beam through it, you can actually then measure that like that scattered pattern that I showed before that green one. And by looking at on a screen measuring the, the dot sizes, you can tell what type of things are scattering in the olive oil. And you can tell if the olive oil is real olive oil or if they put something else in there to, to water it down. So that's one of the quality controls that people use when they're, they're testing samples of olive oils, perfumes the same way. It's a very standard technique as well um, for that type of, uh, for, for ass assessing whether something is legitimate or not. Okay, sir. So there is another question. What is the limb darkening? Yes. So limb darkening happens because if, if the, uh, the, the light that you see from a star comes from the last place the star, the light scattered at the surface of the star. And so if I'm looking directly at the center of the star, um, you're looking through the least bit of atmosphere, you're looking straight in at, the, at, at where the light was generated. And so therefore you're looking at the hot, you're looking at the, the deepest part of the star, the hottest part of the star. When I look at the side of the star, I'm actually, it's like looking through the edge of the Earth's atmosphere, you go through a lot more atmosphere. And so therefore, it winds up that, that you're looking higher in the atmosphere of the, of, the, of the star, and it's at a cooler part of the star, so that it winds up becoming dimmer. So how that changes, as a fun, if I'm thinking about it as a disk, and how the limb darkening changes as you go from the center of the star moving outward, you can make a model of it, but it's, it depends on the metallicity of the star, it depends on the rotation, it depends on whether there's convective transport versus uh, radiative transport in the star. And so there are models, but it hasn't been really measured beyond a percent or so. And so uh, there are measurements at the infrared wavelengths. But if you remember when you're doing these exoplanet searches, they're doing it at the visible wavelengths like, like we're measuring. And so it's much more direct. If we can measure it directly instead of trying to extrapolate, then it's going to help out with exoplanet searches. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, this may be the last question. So is the gravitational attraction may be called one type of nuclear interaction? A gravitational attraction? attraction. Uh, it's not a nuclear interaction. Gravitational interaction has to do with, with mass. Difference. Yeah, it has to do with the mass and the uh, it's attraction of energy with energy. Uh, the, the nuclear interaction has to do with a, it's, a, it's called a color field. And it's, and it's a completely separate type of process from it. So they hope that someday they'll be unified and everything will be due to some super super field that, that each of those are a manifestation of some super field that might have happened at the beginning of the universe. But so far, they don't, they're, they're, they're working on that, but, and that's a goal, but it doesn't exist yet. At least we don't know how it exists yet. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. So we have another question from our student that if any of our students want to join your lab uh, in astronomy, and, uh, so uh, what uh, she or he need to do so after completing their master's in physics or bachelor uh, in physics, so uh, how can they apply and uh, what are the opportunity in, uh, in, in scholarship or other things? So uh, with, with our, we do have international students. Uh, if you go to physics.utah.edu, I don't know if I can put it in a chat window, but um, if you look up my name, K-I-E-D-A, there's, there's very few of us around. <laughs> and so if you put down Utah, U-T-A-H, you can, you can find me. Um, but if you look at physics.utah.edu, oh, there it is. If you go to physics.utah.edu, they actually talk about graduate admissions. And so students that are admitted, you have to apply and you have to take, you know, the, obviously the tests and have to have, have to have a good background in, in, in physics and astronomy. And uh, if you're accepted, the university pays for a, a stipend for you and also pays your tuition for you while you're finishing up, while you're working on your PhD. And if you're going to conferences, we pay for you to go to conferences and all your research expenses, things like that. So we've had a, a number of students from Southeast Asia that have been part of our program, and they're great students. We love having them. 
So thank you, sir. We have another question in chat uh, from Kim. So in physics perspective, is light air travel possible? Is light what? So I think you can see in the private chat, uh, there is a question. Oh, light air travel is possible. Yeah. Well, it's possible for light, but I'm not so sure for people. <laughs> it would take some time. Um, NASA has yeah. been looking at various ways to do this. And they have entertained a possibility of, there was a study that was done a few years ago about what it would take to get to our nearest star, which is uh, Barnard's star. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a few light years away. It's a, like a light year away from us. And it could be possible in the lifetime of a person, but it would be about 30 years out there and 30 years back if we really pushed all the technology and it would cost a lot of money too. Instead, people are thinking about can we send out smaller things that can go faster? And so there are ideas about sending things that get use very little fuel, but using the solar wind and the solar light to accelerate things and sending out small probes that can go out and be accelerated, perhaps get there in maybe uh, uh, five to 10 years. But for a person, it's, it's pretty hard. It's, it's a lot of energy you need. So not, not yet, can't do it yet. Yeah, thank you, sir. So is your institute have a uh, uh, short-term program like a short-term uh, short summer school or internship program or bachelor or master's program? Uh, we, have, we have some program research experiences for undergraduates, but it's generally for people that are in, in, the, in the country. So that's, if somebody was from Bangladesh and they were attending a US university, we would certainly host them if they wanted to come in and work with us for a summer project. Uh, bringing them from Bangladesh here to be for the summer and then back again is difficult. This has to do with visas. And you have to, you have to be a, a, a matriculated student to get a, a visa to actually do this mm -hmm. project. It's difficult to get that, so. Okay, sir. Thank you uh, for your wonderful presentation and discussion session, sir. So the main aim of our program is to motivate our students. I think your uh, excellent uh, lecture will definitely uh, motivate our students and uh, hopefully uh, they might uh, join uh, in this research field later after uh, completing their uh, master's degree. So we thanks again to. for giving us, yeah. Uh, thanks okay, thank again you. for giving us this opportunity uh, to arrange such an important webinar. So bye for today. Okay, cheers. Have a nice day.